I'd like to take you through some of the objects of the institution of the Indian Museum in Calcutta. Let me introduce myself. I'm Taputi Guhata Gupta. I'm an art historian, and I research the early history <coughs> of the setting up of this museum, the formation of its departments, galleries, and object collections. I want to take you through some of these art collections and object stories, a small selection of these, and I'll be interested in telling you as much about the specific pasts to which they belonged, uh, the periods, the provenance of these objects, but equally about their histories of collection and display, how they came to be museum objects. So we'll be thinking about the different circumstances, histories of travels, collections, excavations, safe custody, that bring these objects from the sites of earlier inhabitation to the galleries of the Indian Museum. So I'll be taking you through a small set of objects and following their histories and trails, both in their prior life and then in their life as museum objects. Today is World Heritage Day, so I'd like to introduce you to the one object, in fact it's more a monumental complex and assemblage, in the first archaeological gallery of the Indian Museum that is truly worthy of designation as a world heritage space and object. We are talking today of the remains of the stupa of Bharut, which stand in a gallery specially dedicated to the remains. As we enter the Indian Museum, we come across the entrance gallery with the earliest period sculptures, antique sculptures going back to the 4th, 3rd, 2nd century BCEs. And then we turn right and we enter the gallery which contains the remains of the Bharut Stupa. This particular monumental assemblage is particularly significant both for the history of the museum and for the larger history of archaeology and monument making that I like to think about. This is the first instance an entire monumental complex was taken off site and reassembled with great care and expertise within the precincts of a museum. The remains of the Bharut Stupa were found near the town of Nagod in the district of Satna in what were the central provinces. It's part of a large program of excavation of Buddhist sites that Bharut is unearthed, uh, cleared of its debris, it's, jung it's unjungled a term because many of them would have been grown over with foliage. It is then catalogued, documented. But it is found that the stupa was not in any state to be retained on site. This sparks off a great debate of that time that how far was it legitimate to take structures away from the spaces in which they were discovered and cart them away to museums, often to museums in the West. This was a widespread practice happening across old ancient civilizational sites where European explorers were helping themselves, carting away large bodies of material to institutions like the British Museum. Now, the same fate could perhaps have also happened to the Bharut Stupa. Now, close in proximity to the Bharut Stupa, also in the period, close in period in which it is built, is another stupa complex of central India, that of the Sachi. Uh, now, before the excavations occur at Bharut, Alexander Cunningham, one of the pioneer field archaeologists, excavates the stupa site at Sachi, and 
and carries away some of the reliquary remains inside the stupa. The stupas were built to house the bodily relics of Buddha and its disciples. So there were these stupa sites that were being formed. At Sanchi, Cunningham excavates the site in the 1850s and he recommends that the grand standing gateways around the Sanchi stupa, the exquisitely carved gateways which were then in states of disrepair, he felt the best way of preserving them would be to cart them away to the British Museum where they would be conserved, re-erected and they would take their pride of place within a hall of antiquities in the British Museum. This is in the 1850s. Fortunately for the site of Snatchi, the gateways were not transferred, they remained where they were. The Begum of Bhopal, in whose princely, they were the rulers of the princely state in whose territories Snatchi stood, were reluctant to allow this kind of carting away. Eventually, what happened was a massive cast-making operation where a life-size plaster cast was made of one of the gateways. A replica cast, elaborately made of the face of the original. The cast was then packed in several parts, taken to England where they were reassembled to make up the whole. And the plaster cast replica then became a parent cast from which other castes were made. So the, the cast of the gateway of the Sanchi Stupa became like a traveling monument. It moved from the, Brit the British Museum to different exhibition sites in London, in Paris, in Berlin, and the original plaster cast was then rehoused in the South Kensington Museum. So this is one history of another Stupa site and the way one of its objects traveled off-site, not the original object, but a plaster replica. Now, at the same time that the replica of the Saatchi Gateway was making its rounds and attracting the wonder and admiration of the Western publics in museums and exhibitions, the Bharut remains were among the many sites that were being excavated in the 1870s by Alexander Cunningham and his assistant, J.D. Begler. What Cunningham found at Bharut were a scattered complex where the original stupa was not no longer standing and there was nothing that remained of that original stupa complex, the hemispherical mound. What remained were remnants of railing pillars and gateways. Now it became clear that to protect these remains from pillage from being carted away by locals for building purposes, as was happening across several of these excavated complexes. There was a big debate about what would, how, what would be the best way of conserving them. And an argument now emerged that it would be best to now move them to a museum complex, but the museum complex would be one that would be located in India. Here, a new department of the curatorship of ancient monuments had fallen into place in India. And Henry Hardy Cole, the first curator of ancient monuments in India, was very clear that monuments belonged to India and Indian museums, and they had to remain here. It's worth quoting a small section from Cole, where he writes, we are not answerable, we, the British, for keeping the Grecian marbles in the British Museum. Neither were we concerned for the rights of Egypt when Cleopatra's needle left Alexandria for the Thames embankment. In the case, however, of India, a country which is a British possession, the arguments are different. We are, I submit, responsible for Indian monuments and for their preservation in situ when possible. Now, in situ, conservation and preservation became the ruling principle of the age. And monuments were to be moved off site only when it was proved impossible to retain them where they were. So there were categories called moving, movable antiquities that were scattered remains 
that belonged to a site but had become extricated from it and lay scattered, which now became objects eligible for removal and rearrangement within museum complex. And often, as in the case of Barut, it wasn't just a set of sculptures, but whatever remained on site, it was seen needed removal to a museum. And it was a sign now of the strength and authority of India's own museum, the Imperial Museum in Calcutta, that it was chosen to be the site where the remains would move, not to the British Museum. The reassemblage of Bharat in the Indian Museum also followed and stood against another history of ravage and illegal and inappropriate removal. There was another stupa site uh, which was almost coterminous in age with the stupas of Sanchi and Bharut, which is the site at Amaravati, which had suffered a long history of removal of sculptures and antiquities from the site, denuding it of almost any standing structures by the time the Archaeological Survey of India was formed in 1861. The Amravati sculptures, they were called marbles because they were made in white limestone, so they were reminiscent of marbles. They were not, they were white limestone sculptures. They had been taken away by the collector some of it had come to the Madras Literary Society and found its way to the Government Museum in Madras when it is set up in the 1850s. Large portions had been shipped to England to the India House, where they lay in the backyards till they were discovered by James Ferguson, the historian of Indian architecture. And he gave the Amravati sculptures a new space and a new life as art historical and architectural objects in an exhibition that he mounted for the Paris Universal Exhibition of 1867. Thereafter, the Amravati sculptures found their new home in the British Museum, and they held their pride of place on the great steps of the British Museum. But Amravati's case also was an example for what should not be done to the Bharat remains. It was believed that unlike the Amravati marbles, which were taken off site and taken away from India itself, the Bharat remains should remain here. So they're coming to the Indian Museum, their careful reassemblage by Alexander Cunningham and Begler, and their re display as a museumized object in a gallery was extremely significant. What is also significant that the opening of the gallery signaled the beginning of the archaeological department within the Indian Museum, and it was almost coterminous with the opening of Walter Granville's new building itself. So the opening of the new archaeological gallery with the Bharat remains coincided with the opening of Walter Granville's new building and the beginnings of new departments and galleries within it. So opposite the Barut Gallery was the Geological Gallery, again one of the earliest galleries of the museum. The Barut Gallery was then called the Ashoka Gallery, though the remains were dated to a period just after Ashoka. The Barut Monument was seen to be symbolic of the great age of Ashokan Buddhism. Uh, the great monarch and the great patronage he gave to the religion and to the setting up of stupa complexes across India. So the Bharut remains took their place in a specially dedicated gallery called the Ashoka Gallery in 1878. So it is the this Bharut monument, as we encounter it in the gallery, now called the Bharut Gallery, becomes an extremely important monument of Buddhist art, architecture, and antiquity. Cunningham himself wrote an authoritative account around this monument in a book called The Stupa of Bharut, which 
was published in 1879, within a year of the opening of the gallery, and it could be seen as a detailed scholarly guide to the viewing of the monument and the understanding, the scrutinizing of its history. When we see the, when we visit this grand monument, what strikes us is the wealth of his sculptures. We have one single reconstructed gateway. The stupa was never found and could not be. So it's only the parts of that complex. What is extraordinary here are the railing pillars, the way they've been woven together to reconstruct the way the railing pillar would have stood around the stupa. Here, the complex at Bodhgaya and the complex at Sachi would have provided the model for the reconstruction of the railing pillars and the gateway. What strikes us are this, the large figures, some large standing figures, those of the yakshis, tutelary deities, fertility goddesses. Some of them appear next to trees, bringing the tree to life. They are fertility goddesses. Two of the yakshi figures are now located outside the entrance to the gallery. They welcome you to the monument itself. So the, the yakshis of the Bharut sculptures are unique and they speak to a long history of yakshi sculptures. Some of the large yaksha and yakshi figures are to be seen in the entrance gallery. They are large monumental figures, the Patna yaksha, the Besnagar yakshi, also excavated in central India from the Gwalior state and brought to the Indian Museum. So there were the, these parallel contemporary Yakshi figures. The Bharut figures are smaller in scale and more intricately sculpted and animated. But there's also a longer history of the Yakshi. So now when we leave the Bharut gallery, wander through the Gandhara gallery and enter the long gallery, there are another set of Yakshi sculptures to be encountered. And these are from the second century of the common era, the Bhuteshwara Yakshis from Mathura. So the Bharut Yakshis here belong to a chain of Yakshis, just as the Bharut sculptures are located within an art historical chain that takes us from Sanchi to Bharut to Amaravati a cycle that moves from the second century before the common era to the second century, third century of the common era. So the yakshis are remarkable. What is also remarkable is the intricacy of the sculpted panels, where there is a lot of sculptural storytelling of the life and legend of Buddha. If you look at the medallions and the sculpted panels, as art historians have shown, they relate to episodes from the Jataka tales and actual episodes from the life and legends of Buddha himself. So from the building of monasteries to Prince Ajata Shatru visiting Buddha, there are narrative panels which very intricately replicate the story and legends around Buddhism. So the narrative worth of these sculptures are tremendous. These sculptures were seen to be a window into the worlds of customs, rituals, costumes, beliefs, worship forms, as well as to the times of the legend and history of Buddha himself. Ferguson the pioneer architectural historian of India referred to the sculptures of Sanchi and Bharut as a picture bible of Buddhism. So great was their narrative and historical worth as telling stories. So scrutinizing the sculptures, identifying the stories and legends they tell is part of the fascination of viewing the monument. Very interestingly, Buddha himself is not present in an anthropomorphic form in any of the sculpted representations. This marks the moment before the worship of Buddha in human form. 
Buddha is represented here more by a series of symbols like the Bodhi tree, the Vajrasana throne at Bodh Gaya, where Ashoka is meant to have sat and worshipped under the Bodhi tree, the Dharma Chakra, the form of the stupa itself, and the footsteps, the empty space, the ladder through which Buddha was meant to have descended from heaven. So there is rich material, sculpted material here on the life and times of Buddha to be scrutinized as art historians have done. There's also, Bharut is also rich for its epigraphic material. And we see some of these inscriptions in the body of the sculptures, especially in the reconstructed gateway. Part of it is new slabs put there, but some of it is the original material. It is these inscriptions that allowed Cunningham to give a precise date to the monument, to date it between the 200 and 150 BCE to the reign of King Dhanapati in the Mahakoshala kingdom. These inscriptions around stupas also show the importance of lay donors at the time, Buddhist mercantile communities, and how far they were contributing to the building of these embellishments around the stupa, the railing pillars, the gateways. Bharut contributes to that rich epigraphic, sculptural and iconographic history of ancient Buddhism. The red sandstone is very specific to the region. It marks it out from the Sanchi sculptures, which are in buff sandstone, and the Amaravati sculptures, which are in white limestone. So the red sandstone material, the intricacy of the sculpture, the intricacy also of its reconstruction makes this a marvel of a reassembled archaeological monument within the precincts of a museum. Side by side with Cunningham's scholarship, authority and expertise over this excavated monument and its museumization, I'd like to introduce you to also the figure of a Bengali archaeologist and his attachment and the stories he weaves around this same museum object. Rakhal Dash Banerjee was working as an assistant in the archaeological department of the Indian Museum, not under Cunningham, but under the new superintendent, Theodore Block, who was superintendent both of the archaeological section of the museum and of the Archaeological Survey of India's Eastern Circle at that time. In 1911, Rakhal Dash helps Block, Theodore Block, in cataloging the archaeological material, which had begun to grow around the first and central object of the Parut Stupa in its Ashoka Gallery. Rakhal Dash was a scholar of ancient history, epigraphy, and archaeology. He had studied with Pandit Haraprasad Shastri, in the study of texts and epigraphy. He had also trained under Theodore Bloch. He himself was conducting his own archaeological research. He was writing on the history of Bengal through its archaeological material. He would be writing on the Eastern Indian Medieval School of Sculpture. And it is during the time of his working at the museum that he also begins writing his historical fiction where the stones of Bharut would be the central protagonist. This was Rakhal Dash Banerjee's first experiment with a genre of historical fiction, where he took readers back to the ancient period of Buddhism and Hinduism, where he used his expertise as archaeologist and ancient historian to tell the story through the authentic lens of a scholar who knew all the archaeological details of the past and the material remnants through which that past could be reconstructed. So fascinated by this marvel of a monument in the museum that he encountered, he was drawn more and more to it, and he made it the Bharut Stupa, the centerpiece of a novel that he termed Pasha Nirkatha, The Story of Stone. It was first serialized in sections in a Bengali journal called Arjoborto, and later published as a book. 
Rakhal Dash's Pashanir Katha again introduces a new dimension to the modern life of the Barut Stupa as an archaeological relic and as a modern museum object. Where Rakhal Dash Banerjee approaches it with the expertise of an archaeologist but also with the affective attachment of an Indian wishing to extricate the object from Western archaeologists, the Western Museum establishment, for a history that belonged to India and Indians. So there's a new incipient sense of nationalism that informs the retelling of the tale of Parut, the way in which he makes the stone a silent witness to the deep antiquity of India, where its story goes back long before the construction of the stupa itself, when the stone was just like a speck lying in the lands. And then it travels into the time of its quarrying, it's being brought to the site of Mohakoshala, the building of the stupa, the, its consecration as one of the most celebrated monuments of Buddhism, its life under different Buddhist regime, its appropriation by Hindu Shaivite groups, its reclaiming by other Buddhist rulers, its then passage to ruin and devastation as different groups of invaders, the Huns, the Afghans, the Mughals, take over these spaces. And then the stones of Bharut finds a new life in the hands of the English archaeologist who recovers it, returns its true history, and gives it a new life as a protected, preserved, and conserved object of history in the Indian Museum. Now, it is as this reconsecrated museum object that Rakhal Dash encounters it, but he also wishes to now breathe a new life and a national imagination into the monument, where through his expertise, the stone is able to tell of different histories and different times it was part of. So this idea of the interlocutor and the object, where the object is personified, the stone becomes the narrator and protagonist of the tale. But it is Rakhala speaking all through, where the stone, it is he, it is his expertise that allows the stone to tell its story. So Pashanir Kotha then renders the story of Parut into the story of ancient India, its rise, its peak of glory of the days of ancient Buddhism of the era, its decline, its passage through the medieval era, which is inevitably seen as a time of darkness and uh, of ravage and of neglect, till it finds a new life again through the disciplines of archaeology, through the institution of the museum, as a modern archaeological historical relic. Its antiquity would be now reimagined and positioned within the body of a monument. But it had entered its modern life. And it is in this identity as a modern monument that it could also be deeply inflected with nationalist sentiment, with nationalist affect. And from this time, the time when Cunningham writes his authoritative account around it and Rakhal Dash writes his imaginative historical fiction around this monument. The Bharut Stupa has continuously engaged epigraphists, art historians, scholars of Buddhism to continuously re-encounter its form, its physical fabric, the details of its sculpted uh, images, its epigraphs. It's had a long and rich life as both a museum monument, as an object, as a cherished object of Indian art history. In the 1930s, we have a Buddhist scholar of Bengal, Beni Madhuburua, 
a practicing Buddhist himself, who writes another account of the stupa and brings a new world of a modern reinvented Buddhism to speak to this wonder of an ancient Buddhist monument. Now the gallery remains exactly where it was first founded. It is now called the Bharut Gallery. It remains where it is. It is one of those few objects in the museum which because of the nature of the assemblage cannot be removed and it has remained precisely where we are. The gallery though has undergone a set of changes over time, some for the better, some not perhaps to its advantage. There was a time when a false ceiling was brought in for the gallery to air condition it. That really interfered with the height of the gateway because much of the wonders of seeing this monument is to be able to understand the scale of its elevation. So the removal of the false ceiling and the air conditioning was important. In fact, it was debated whether a monument which would have been out in the open in any case needed air conditioning. There was varnish and repainting done of the sculptures in the name of conservation which was decried. Fortunately, much of the stones have been returned as far as possible to their unvarnished state. So these were some of the changes. The Bharut monument had been erected on red sandstone pedestal. It was believed that the material was absorbent of water and dampness and was the best therefore to use the red sandstone as close as possible to the material of the original uh, monument. That formed the initial base on which the monument stood. Whether it was a good idea removing that base has been debated. That base was removed, those red sandstone slabs lie in the courtyard outside or they used to lie and a different cemented pedestal has been formed which is less water absorbent. When I first encountered the Bharut Stupa in the gallery in the late mid and late 90s when I was researching the history of the Indian Museum and was a regular visitor to the museum's library. I had to walk right through the Parut and Gandhara gallery. What struck me was the rich photographic displays around the monument. There were photographs showing sculpted friezes from Sanchi, from Bodh Gaya. There were sections showing different motifs, particularly from Bodh Gaya, of the Bodhi tree, of the railing pillars, of the small stupa complex. There were rich photographic contextualization of the monument through by bringing in references to the Buddhist sculptural iconography of Sanchi and Bodh Gaya and to the monumental uh, spaces. So a disappeared stupa complex was recontextualized through references to existing stupa complexes around us. And that form of photography was part of the archaeological displays because different in the long gallery, two different objects of sculpture would have the sites, photographs of the sites around it. Over time, those photographs were removed. Now, Parut stands in a strikingly emptied gallery. Uh, where you only have one or two sites of the Bodhgaya shrine and a Buddhist monks worshipping, perhaps to give a brief semblance of Buddhism and existing Buddhist sites of worship. But one misses the rich photographic, iconographic and sculptural context in which I first encountered the Bharat Stupa. But the monument is nonetheless resplendent. Uh, one needs to bring more and more visitors, more and more attention, scholarly, public, popular attention back to it. There are concerns about crowds converging too closely on the fragile body of the monument. Should there be 
a railing and a guard but that again would take away from a lot of the beauty and the grandeur of the monument. How is it best preserved? How is it reintroduced? Its meaning to new publics remains a challenge for museum curators. I like to believe that having undergone so many metamorphoses, Bharut Gallery awaits a new kind of curatorial intervention again to bring back the rich past of the monument and the rich history of its museumization and display back to public attention. The past of Bharut, the many pasts of Bharut, needs to now be brought into the present through some new curatorial interventions. But the monument stands grand as ever, and it's been a privilege to be able to talk about it on the occasion of World Heritage Day to all of you.